Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 206, SeanCon Spring 2023. I'm the Sean of SeanCon, your host, and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. Remember that we record live at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, and you should come join us in the lobby, our chat room. Tonight, we're going to be talking all about the games we played and other things we did this past weekend as part of Sean Con Spring 2023. That will be followed by a featured review of the most epic and long game we played the entire weekend, Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game. Due to our main topic, the weekend review should be shorter as usual, but we do have a couple games that I played without Sean to talk about. For links to all of the various games and other things we mentioned during the show, check out our show notes, which you can find at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 206. Before we get to all of that, let's head over to the suggestion box. Welcome to this week's suggestion box. Here we share a small selection of feedback we've gotten on our content, starting with a comment on our rather famous supers post. Been about a month or so, so it's about time we got another big comment on this one. Buckaroo Banzai came from the fifth dimension to say, Mutants and Masterminds is amazing. Start simple using a power archetype or a power profile pre-built and keep the same or tweak a few powers and it's not harder than D&D 5e to create a character. Then, if the DM knows the system, it's not hard to learn it over several sessions, only using your powers and abilities as a player. It is unparalleled in flexibility. 125, or sorry, 1,250 powers in just three books and up to 2,000 all the books and pretty easy customization and adding more. You can alter powers with over 120 effects and flaws too. Yeah, that sounds simple to me. Well, I admit there is some great power and flexibility in mutants and masterminds. If I'm playing the devil's advocate, in Masks, there are far more than 2,000 powers, as there are no predefined powers at all. Your powers just do what you want them to do without struggling to figure out any math. Now, that being said, I have unquestionably run into problems with that freedom that a bit of constraint would have alleviated. So there is a place for all of it. Realistically, I need to play at a Mutants and Masterminds table, maybe mm -hmm. at a con sometime, and get the real experience from a confident, familiar GM, uh, GM with the system. I gotta say, that topic just keeps on giving. <laughs> well, next up, a few, uh, couple of comments on our 199.5 bonus episode. Mike Robinson says, in regards to why the Catan hate, Catan is fine until everyone learns that trading is bad. Then it becomes a terrible game. Chris Lundgren commented on, I love Star Trek Attack Wing, and I had the original and did get the improved second edition. It has much cleaner rules, and they improved the quality of the later edition miniatures. I also love Starfleet Battles at StarfleetGames.com. Now, finally, Philip Hughes writes, Anyone still play second edition Star Wars from West End Games? Still my favorite game of all time. All right, we're going to look through those comments and reply in reverse order. So starting with West End Games Star Wars, that is definitely still being played. It has a number of lifelong fans and is well still finding new players, mostly through fan-created content. While it's not official, I kind of recommend you try to find the Star Wars re-up, though I won't be providing links to that as it's not official. There is also the Open D6 system, which is based on it, and a number of people who have created content for that. Now, personally, I did not play this one when it was out. I, I didn't play a Star Wars role-playing game, despite all the ones I was into. That just wasn't one we ever got into back in the 80s and 90s. But I did try it playing much later um, as an adult, and it was when the Wizards of the Coast D20 system came out. There was a, a WotC Star Wars, and then there was a WotC Star Wars Revised. And I played the WotC Star Wars Revised. And it was good. Like I had a solid campaign going and th went pretty well. But then I tried the West End Games one and fell in love with it. I found we were able to tell much more Star Wars like star stories with the D6 system than we could with the D&D &D based D21. 
That said, I did put it away after checking out the Fantasy Flight Star Wars series and the narrative dice pool that I had already fallen in love with from Warhammer 3rd Edition. But thanks for the comment, Philip. I really wish people weren't quite so enamored with D20 systems. Admittedly, they still aren't as random as the old Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay percentage dice, <laughs> but they're still, for the most part, simply too random to really tell a properly heroic tale. Yeah, I, I don't mind D20 for the right thing. Like at that time, this was the D&D 3.5 days and the glut of D20 OGL games that came out. And it was mostly about game balance, which is what 3.5 did, which is great for D&D and great to make it so all characters are equal and awesome for organized play. But it just didn't work for Star Wars. Star Wars needs to be heroic. It's all about awesome people doing awesome things and over the top. And I'm not just talking about Jedis and the Force, though that's part of it. A smuggler in that game could have better stats and do just as much damage with their blaster as a Jedi could with their lightsaber because of game balance. Whereas West End games felt more like Star Wars, especially with the Force system. And they used a Force system where you didn't have to be a Force user to use the Force, which is, a, again, a whole Star Wars thing. Kind of represents luck and just how much prowess should we have. Well, uh, Han Solo may not have the Force. I think he was definitely using it many times. I don't know. Was his midichlorian count really high enough? Nah, exactly. <laughs> it binds all things. Yeah. As, as an example in our game, we were playing a game where we had a, bun a rebel base was attacked and they were trying to get off planet. And to get off planet, they were going to go raid an imperial shipyard. And the Wookiee character in the game went all um, arboreal and was swinging through the trees. And yes, did the whole Wookiee Tarzan yell because you have to, because while you're playing Star Wars games, you have to do callbacks and managed to swing through the trees, land into a land speeder, hit the land speeder into gear, slam it backwards into uh, ATST, knock it over, and then peel out of the base with one action. I would hate to play out that scene in D20. Like, it would take all night just to do that one scene, and this was one die roll. So I will admit, I am a fan of the West End game system. Fair, fair. Next, we have Star Trek uh, Attack Wing series. That was the next comment. And I am glad to hear the new edition of Attack Wing is better than the first because I like the first one. Now I'm even more tempted to pick it up, especially since after reading this comment, I went online and I was looking at the game. It ends up there's a whole bunch of cooperative game boxes out there where you just buy, excuse me, where you just buy one game and get a full campaign. And I got to say, that sounds appealing. Cooperative Star Trek with cool looking minis. I'm all for it. Also, props for the Starfleet battle shout out. That is truly classic tech, trek, tech, trek, trek, trek word. Not tech, text in the chat, treks on my sheet. Trek gaming. Um, that is a game that has been around forever, and I have enjoyed it in the past, as long as I had an expert present to coach me. <laughs> Thanks, Chris, for that. Finally, on to Mike's comment. Thanks for that, Mike. And yeah, trading based games stink if you have players who won't trade. Now, I'm not sure on the part about learning that trading is bad in Catan because trading is awesome in Catan and needs to happen to be able to play well. And it's ruined if people don't trade. So I don't know about trading being bad in Catan. Making bad trades is bad. Don't let a, a player bully you into making trades. But I will say a game of Catan is ruined right from the start if it's your first game and someone won't trade with you. I totally understand hating it. Wait, you can trade in Catan? What kind of woke socialist? Anyway. Let's move on, and I think we will stop there this week. Thank you for your comments and feedback. Remember, we always appreciate the interaction, even if we don't read your comments out on the show. Not only do we love interacting with you, but even simple comments like, great review, help get our stuff noticed by that mighty algorithm. All hail the algorithm. Now on to some sort announcements. There are just a couple of things we want to make you aware of this week. So first off, as announced last week, the entire Tabletop Bellhop team will be at Origins 2023 in downtown Columbus, Ohio. We're going to be there for the entire event as well as a day before and after so we can get set up and take a day off before heading home. Now, one of the big reasons we are going to this con is to network with other podcasters, designers and publishers. And to that end, if anyone wants to schedule a meeting, be that a demo of your latest game to share podcasting tips, maybe to do a playtesting session or just grab a drink together, feel free to reach out mo at tabletopdelhot.com or send me a DM on your favorite social media platform. Now, next up, we felt it was time for a bit of self-promotion. 
Now, while we mention it at least once a show that you, our fans, can show your support by backing our Patreon, it's been a long time since we talked about what you get besides making us smile. Even at our base level of $2, you get some cool patron-only bonuses. These include patron roles and access to the patron-only section of the Tabletop Bellhop Discord, which you can find at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. Copies of our pre-production show notes for each episode and behind-the-scenes blog posts on Patreon. Now, the next tier I like to think of as the sweet spot for backing us. For five bucks, you become a hotel guest, which gets you a ton of bonuses, including priority given to your questions if you ask them, bonus audio from our live show, which we're recording right now, the audio from any Sunday brunch shows we do, early access to my segment on what you've been playing Wednesday when it does come back there, taking a short hiatus, and then five bonus entries at least to any giveaways we hold. We give you access to Patreon-only polls where you can help us determine what kind of content to create, plus all the rewards Sean just said. Along with these rewards, we also have long-term backer rewards for when people hit total donation amounts, which includes Deanna shipping you out a box of goodies and more. Now, those are the main things we wanted to highlight. We do have some higher tiers as well as what we like to call cardboard concierge services that I offer, including like playtesting games or planning game nights for you. You can check those out as well as support us at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. We hope to call out your name on our patron list at the end of the show next week. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question is, so what happened at SeanCon Spring 2023? Okay, I admit it. No one actually asked this question. But we do get requests often for more con coverage. Um, actually, we just had it the other day in our Discord. Someone came up and was asking about con coverage. So they were talking about Origins. And while Sean Con isn't Gen Con or PAX or Origins, it was us getting together, getting in a lot of gaming over three days, enough that it seemed like enough to talk about as a main segment instead of just tossing in our weekend and review at the end of the show. So while I was covering all the panels at Sean Con, Mo and Dee were at the tables. Uh, no. <laughs> yes. Now you may be asking yourself, wait a minute, I thought Sean lived in Windsor now, and Sean Con was a thing of the past. Well, we thought so too. See, the thing is, with Sean being down here in Windsor, it doesn't mean he has any less obligations. As he just mentioned in our lobby, yeah, he's extremely busy with work, and he still has obligations with his families and goes back up to Hamilton to visit his kids. Proximity alone really didn't turn into quite as much gaming time together as we expected. Now, we have sat at the table together more often, and he's made it out to some public events, but it's not like we're gaming together every week. Between work, family, and all too often illnesses, yeah. it just hasn't happened nearly as much as we expected when the move initially happened. Now, another thing I've noticed, which is something... I've also noticed with all public play events that I run is that when you can get together anytime, when there's a regular event, it's always happening. It becomes far too easy to say, nah, let's just do this later. Or no, we'll get to it next week. Or you know what? Let's put it off for another week. And while well, that putting off just happened, never happens. So the, the later never happens. Let's do this later. Yeah. And then later, maybe later and months go by. The thing is, it's really easy the way things are now to sit here on a Wednesday night, getting to the segment about what you got coming up and going, hey, we're going to play this and we're going to play that. And we got these five games on the obligation and we're going to knock the pile of shame down by 10. But then when the week rolls on, those game nights to actually play them just don't happen. Sadly enough, when you're too tired, you need to finish something up. You're not feeling great for one reason or another. Excuses are really easy to make. Yeah. So to combat both of these, I wanted to try something. I wanted to bring back our semi-regular Sean Cons. And by that, I mean setting aside an entire weekend to just hang out, game together, and enjoy each other's company and check out some of the local sites. Have Sean come over on a Friday night, stay overnight a couple nights, and not leave until Sunday morning, and pretty much put the work aside, except for some things that need to get done. And this way, I couldn't even oversleep or have car trouble. I was, in the best possible way, trapped. <laughs> and frankly, the couch there seems like a second or third home. I really quite sl sleep quite well there every time. Yeah, that's always nice to it. Now, to make this more of an event, in addition to gaming here at my place, I planned out an entire week of events. 
most gaming related, but there was some time out and about as well, which of course involves some great local food. And my thought process was, I need this to feel special. Or again, it's just going to be far too easy to be like, oh, you know what? I know we we're going to play all weekend, but I, you know, I'm kind of tired. I'm going to head home. Like, let's make this a big deal so it feels special. One thing you'll always get if you spend a few days with Mo is a dining experience. <laughs> I am also known as the big dude who likes food. Indeed. Now, speaking of food, let's start with our first meal. Uh, unlike our normal game segment, this is about all of Sean Con, not just the game. So this started off with our first ever try of a place called Cranky Burner. Burger. Burner? Cranky Burner. No, Cranky Burger. Cranky Burger. This is a weird little place that happens to be on Jefferson and Tecumseh, which is pretty close to my house, that is in the back of an actual restaurant that's well known in the area. All of this there is this blue door. There's no sign for Cranky Burger whatsoever. And it's deliver and takeout only. This is the kind of place that started up because of COVID. It, they opened up a delivery only DoorDash based business, basically. And it's done well enough that they keep expanding. In the morning, it's a breakfast burrito place. Now at nights, it's a cranky burger and it's also some kind of wing place. They're both using the same kitchen. Now, I heard about this place thanks to local social media. There is a smash burger place that we've all tried and we all enjoy called Whamburg. And every time I shared a picture of Whamburg, someone was like, oh, have you tried Cranky Burger yet? Oh, you got to try Cranky Burger. Oh, if you like Smash Burger, you got to try Kink. Cranky Burger. So we did. I've been meaning to do it for a while. We each got burgers and sides. Um, we got three different types of burgers. I know mine had, um, what do you call it? Mine, mine had um, cheese curds on it and other stuff. Bacon, I think. Um, D, I don't even know. I think hers had mushroom and stuff. You had... Like the, the cheesy one. Yeah, I had the mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. So mac and cheese burger. And then we each got different sides. We wanted to try them. So there were tater tots. Um, I got onion rings. Deanna got waffle fries. And then we also ordered these like uh, cheese fritters yeah. as, as a side dish. And mm -hmm. well, peanut butter cups. Yeah, I mean, the burger was fantastic. It had a great bun with that nice crisp sort of, you know, egg wash coating on it. Um, the cheese sauce that went with the, the mac and cheese really balanced out all the flavors fantastically. And it was, it was a good, you know, smash style burger. What really shocked me though, was the tater tots because I was <laughs> fully expecting, you know, a bunch of, of McCain tater tots yep. that had been deep fried and they weren't, they no. were not McCain tater fries. They were their own tater tots and they had been really well seasoned. Like, yeah. these were the best tater tots I have ever had, which sounds really weird to say, but it's true. Yeah. And the onion rings were good, but even better was some kind of southern barbecue sauce to dip them in. I don't know what, excuse me, I don't know what that sauce was, but it was fantastic. So we all enjoyed that, and we'll probably be ordering Cranky Burger again sometime. But on to the games. First up was a two-player game of Disney Sorcerer's Arena. And the goal with this game was to try out the expansion. So I grabbed the three characters from Thrills and Chills, which was Mother Gothel, the Horn King, and Jack Skellington. And Sean ended up grabbing the other, the most recent set leading the chart. Yeah, so I had uh, Buzz Lightyear, Scar, and Elsa. Now, just as a, a quick summary, I figure why not talk about each of these characters and what we thought of them, kind of as a short review leading up to our formal review, which might or might not be next week. We'll see. Um, first off, Gothel, I loved. Gothel was a ton of fun to play, mostly about doing nasty things to the opponents. Lots of cards that made the opponent banish cards. Cards that, I was amused, he had a card that damaged all princesses in play. Of course, there were no princesses in play. But that was one of the things. Um, lots of stealth cards. She had lots of ways to not get hit. And big damage cards that required the stealth. So I, I really enjoyed playing Mother Gothel in Disney Sorcerer's Arena. While Buzz Lightyear was a real ranged powerhouse with the ability to do follow up damage to opponents who had mm -hmm. been hit, as well as damage at multiple different ranges, which usually players are either up close or ranged. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a very solid uh, utility character that would sort of like just easily fit into almost any group. And one thing I did notice with him is his best ability, though, was on his card. So I don't think he. He'd be as good without using the full level four rules, the right. chapter four rules. Next was the Horton King, which I wanted to love. The uh, Black Cauldron is actually one of my favorite Disney movies. 
and his character summons cauldron born, which are like undead coming out of the cauldron. And it added whole rules for minions, basically. It's not what they call them, but that's what I'd like to call them. They kind of they're tokens that act as characters. Had all kinds of awesome cards for moving these tokens and attacking with them. Problem is I couldn't get any in play. The only way to get them in play was to earn a crown, and I couldn't seem to get crowns and often enough to keep them in. And then when I put them in, they just got wiped out. So they were great when I had them, but then when I didn't, almost every card in the Horn King's deck was based on these and useless otherwise. So this one, I just think I need a combo. I need something that earns me crowns without knocking people out, like some kind of quick way to get crowns to get these out right away so they don't just get wiped out. Yeah. So I also had Scar, and this was the first character I'd seen who, like uh, um, Gothel with the, you know, affects princesses, Scar mm -hmm. affected on all the villain keywords that were out uh, in play. Uh, and the other handy thing was he could steal a victory point space out from under you. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, <laughs> when he was hogging the glory, the entire team suffered by not healing as much. Uh, so not surprisingly, Scar is a selfish character. Shocking. Yes. And that was part of my problem with the Horn King is every time I put him on a stupid victory spot, Scar would push me off and I didn't get my cauldron born. Um, next up, uh, final one in the Thrills and Chills expansion is Jack Skellington, one of the cooler characters from Disney of all time. Uh, surprisingly, a tank, some of the highest health in the game, not the highest, but up there, like 10 health and lots of cards that cause status effects. Now, the most common being in a status effect called Frightened, which forced your opponents to move and not end their turns next to you. Now, you weren't forced not to, but if they chose to end in melee, they took damage. Now, the big thing about Jack seemed to be about moving status tokens from one character to their allies. And that seemed like a cool idea, but I just couldn't get it to work. I just it maybe it was the characters I had it with, whatever was going on. It just I couldn't use that power. And that was their talent that you should be able to use multiple times. And when you leveled them up, it just made that better. But in the entire game, I didn't even move a single token. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Uh, that's one of the things that we we get when we just kind of blindly. Uh draft now i had elsa who had some fantastic movement abilities and interestingly though she is a magical character her hatred of her magical abilities uh you know canonically allowed you to search your deck for non-magic cards mm -hmm. um she was a real hit and move player uh with an ability to tank that i never even actually got onto the table as <laughs> she, one of her skills on the card is an invulnerability of one which allows you to just shrug off at, a, at any attack uh, once. Now, what I need to try at some point is I still think Elsa would combo well with Fusilier or Mickey who search your deck for magic cards. And I'm thinking you might be able to cycle through your deck really neat between the two of them where you're looking for one type or the other, or you use one, see what the card is, and then use the other to grab it. Very I fair. think that'd be a neat combo to try. But we also did notice one thing this, this time uh, as we were sort of playing with the effect because we we generally had a few effects in play and one of the things from the mobile game is effects are uh, the effects on your character are uh dealt with at the end of your turn mm -hmm. so you make your turn and then you resolve any any effects that are stacked on your character well as in the board game it's the first step the first yeah. thing you do is resolve uh, and so they've actually had to go in and double up the number of effects that they're putting on players just in order for them to have any effect at all. Uh, and we discovered that little sort of strange yeah. thing as we were trying to figure out, well, I put this effect on you twice, but you're only getting affected by it once. And it turns out that's actually the point. Uh, they always put the effect on you twice or you'd never be affected by mm -hmm. it at all. Yeah, that's a weird timing thing. It's like they made a decision and it worked for the first. Well, that would have been in the thrills and chills. It worked for the main game in the second first expansion. No problem at all. It's all logical. But then when they wanted to put a fear effect in, because it's not a triggered effect, it's an ongoing effect. You don't just need it there at the start of your turn. You need it there for an entire rotation. So they give you two tokens. So the first time when you activate, you take a token off, but then it stays. It, it was kind of weird. Yeah. Now, after Disney, we started a new game of Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game. Now, this was Deanna's first time playing, but the second game for Sean 
or fourth game for Sean based on previous plays because fourth hunt for Sean, I think, yep. and I, due to a previous hunt we had with Tori and Kat. Um, the thing with this game is one game is five encounters, five hunts, and takes a long time to get through. Um, each hunt is one to two hours. Now, Friday night, we did the first two encounters of a hunt. And I got to say, my big shock was we had to convince Deanna to play. We actually had to talk her into it. She was over on the couch. I'm like, come on, you got to come over. You got to play. I think you'll like it. Wow. Like by the end of those two plays, she was like Googling expansions and going, I need more. Where are more customization? Where are more things I can buy in the deck? Where can I get more Horizon Zero Dawn? And that shocked me. Yeah, now, Mo and Deanna both knew all about Horizon Zero Dawn, but I've never owned a PlayStation of any sort. And so other than hearing other people talk about it and seeing cosplays of it, it's not a property I actually know anything about. So I've been coming at the game from a very different point of view than Mo and D. That said, if you want hours and hours of random Amerithrash, semi-co-op, just killing monsters with a bit of tactics, it's a pretty solid offering for that. That was it for Friday night. So the next morning we got up uh, fairly early for us, <laughs> set some alarms, managed to head out of town to Kingsville by 10 a.m. Uh, first stop there was Miller's Bakery, where Deanna and I grabbed some treats, which I got to say, if you're a local and haven't been to Miller's Bakery, you got to go. Some of the best baked goods I've ever had. Strongly recommend their savory croissant. The, the ham and cheese croissant is one of the best things out there. And Deanna tried a spinach and ricotta one and liked that even more than the ham and cheese. I preferred the ham and cheese. Um, the whole thing with this place is only open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and they're only open until they sell out. So it's one of those things that if we are going out to Kingsville and it's a weekend, we try to get there, stop by, and pick up some stuff. And we managed to pick up a couple boxes, stuff to eat the next morning and stuff to kind of give us some treats throughout the week. I'm not really the treat store, but I definitely agree that the stuff looked phenomenal there wasn't a single thing out on display that wouldn't have been yummy yeah oh just fantastic stuff i, I just wish you had tried at least a croissant like i don't like sweet and i'm like oh but it's savory that's what it, we that's actually deanna's favorite part is they do a lot of savory dishes and not just sweet treats from there we uh walked over to joe hot and cold this is a new coffee bar uh, that replaced the Grove Brewery, which moved down to the street to an awesome new place. So it, it replaced that, and it's, I, I don't know, it's its kind of a high-end coffee shop hangout place, and, and, like, people sit upstairs and order their food from apps and then go downstairs to grab it and don't interact with people. And there's a lot of group seating on the main floor and then big seating upstairs. And we've been here before, and Deanna really liked the coffee. I thought the coffee was okay, and we got some really good breakfast sandwiches um, our last time in Kingsville. But unfortunately, this time, they weren't up to par. I, I, this was the worst meal of the trip. I actually felt bad for bringing Sean there. And I'm just wondering, because they any other time we've been there, we've had a hard time finding somewhere to sit. That was not a problem this time. So I hope this isn't a sign that they're just sliding downhill and losing popularity. Yeah, I mean... They felt kind of pretentious. And aside from the coffee, which I think Jeff would have approved of, mm -hmm. uh, really nothing to write home about. Uh, both D and I had, uh, you know, notably cold portions of our sandwiches. So oh, that was mine, too. I just yeah. had, there was no point in complaining after you two complained. <laughs> yeah, definitely cold. I, and I, I, last time was a problem. I think they made the sandwiches fresh because I remember waiting longer. And I think they've switched their breakfast sandwich to we make them in the morning and we heat them up for people. Or something because yeah well it was not good so so sad news about joe hot and fresh from there we walked down the street because downtown kingsville is not a big place lots of really cool places in a tight-knit little spot to the red lantern coffee roasters because as everyone knows who's been a fan of the show for very long knows we are all about our coffee and probably drink far too much of it though i'm out right now and i could probably use some more um, so we walked down the street to this place. This used to be Merley's. Merley's was one of the most amazing things in Kingsville. I'm still sad they're gone. But Red Lantern's becoming a new favorite. Um, this is, it's a coffee shop where they roast their own coffee and they have their own blends and they serve, you know, snacks. It's a coffee shop. You, you get, it's a cafe. You get what you want. What I dig about this place is just somehow super comfortable. Like just, you feel at home there. I don't, I, there's just something comfortable about it. Maybe because I spent my teen years in coffee shops. 
Um, plus, it's also very gamer friendly. Actually, when we walked in, there was a couple in a corner playing Disney Villainous against each other. So that was pretty cool. Plus, they have some nice big tables that don't have a ton of chairs. So they only have four chairs. So I don't feel like I'm taking up someone else's spot. And I just I dig that place a lot. And thankfully, when we got there, they were not as crowded as when we first drove past them, where we had looked in and seen that they were packed, possibly standing room only. Um, It's just, you know, a cool, chill vibe there. Uh, They had a great little uh, sort of tart sized quiche to make up for the uh, the sandwich at Joe's that hadn't uh, (laughs) hadn't done it. And uh, yeah, no, it was just a nice, quiet place to to play games and uh, enjoy uh to be honest the coffee was a little wasn't as fancy as at joe's yep. I, it was it's more of a generic not generic but you know simple coffee whereas there was definitely more notes of flavoring when at that joe's coffee but it's a perfectly good cup of joe and to be honest i prefer red lanterns but i don't like dark roast right it's more of a medium lighter roast and and again more generic my favorite coffee is still a, a donut shop coffee donut house. Like, <laughs> so yeah, I prefer that coffee to Joe's and I knew that. Um, and yeah, they have good treats. I got a, a cheddar bacon scone because again, breakfast was, was a little lacking. So, and then as the day went on, we got multiple cups. I don't know, just friendly place. The, the owners are friendly. It was, it, we happened to get there as they were emptying out. And it was funny because another wave showed up as they were closing and I got to give the place props. To their closing in five minutes, they let two groups come in, order coffee for there, and let them stay. Like, we left, and they were still there. So I always appreciate when a place isn't silly about their hours and isn't like, oh, no, sorry, we're closing in 15 minutes. You can't have a coffee. And that happened to us last time we were there. Now we, this time, just managed to wrap up our game, which gets to the game we played. So the first game of the day was Castellans of Valeria which some of you may be going, whoa, whoa, what's this? I've never heard of this one. That's because it's not out yet. We actually have a prototype copy of the game. This is going to be the latest Valeria game that is launching on Kickstarter in June. I think June 6th is the day, but don't quote me on that. I'm sure we'll be talking about it as we get closer to the Kickstarter. Now, this is a strange kind of game because it's an area majority game. Reminds me quite a bit of El Grande. It's almost like a folk on a map game, except your folk are buildings. You're not placing armies out. You're placing various buildings into districts. Now, when I we first saw this and when we agreed to review it, we thought this was a dice placement game where you were going to take dice, put them on spots to activate things. And that's not really what it is. Instead, it's dice drafting where you are drafting different dice and they're going to give you resources. And then you have a bunch of different options to take. And then you spend a die to take it. So it's almost like like Race for the Galaxy or San Juan or Puerto Rico where you're picking an action to do. And you get a bonus if you use the right die, which I found really neat. Now, those actions include building manors, putting them out, hiring citizens, going to the wharf to buy and sell goods, um, building giant artifacts that score, and basically building up these different districts. And then scoring points for basically uh, everything you build is worth one point. Now, whoever has the most po- most things built gets victory points. Yeah, there's a lot going on, and you really need to focus as the board gets busier and busier and busier. Uh, the scoring round, in fact, is quite difficult because there's all there's so much in each section that that mm-hmm. just making sure that you have counted everything properly and and assign the correct victory points can be tough because it's yeah. easy to miss things with all these cute little uh, meeple buildings out there. That being said, there's a lot to this game and it definitely had a bit of the Valeria feel to it. Yeah. Now, a part of that, of course, is the fact you have the Miko's artwork combined with the four guilds you're used to having in the Valeria. And I never remember what they are. I always call it priest thieves fighters and 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 blacksmiths but i know those aren't right so yeah just it it, it did it had that valeria feel the citizens any game where you buy citizens that give you powers that's a very valeria thing to me Um, what i was really impressed by is this is a prototype but the two layered player boards are honestly the best i've ever played with there there's no warping they're they're nice and detailed they're clear to read it's very obvious that when i uncover this i get this I was really impressed by those boards. Yeah, no, they were fantastic. Uh, now we don't the 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 building meeple don't fit it properly, but we knew that no. going in. That was that was given to us up front. 
Uh, but even even allowing for that, they were still perfectly fine. Yeah. There was nothing wrong with them. Uh, one of the things that we definitely did in this game, I think, was underused the citizens. So as yeah. well as building buildings, there are citizen cards that you can collect that allow you to modify dice or or have other special things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and reading through the booklet that we had kind of ignored during the game, turns out there are some powerful combos that we probably yeah. could have taken advantage of. Yeah, I got to say the amount of wood in this is impressive. I'm slightly concerned it's going to lead to a high player count or sorry, cost of the game component cost. But we'll see uh, when that comes out, because right now we don't we don't have a price point for this. But what was nice is not only are there a ton of different so there's like meeples for your generic building. You got a meeple for your lighthouse. You got a meeple for your boats. You got a meeple for each of your citizens. Those are all the same. So meeple for citizens. Um, there's a windmills. There's three artifacts. And I'm probably missing at least one other building type that you can build. And they're all silk screened with like bits of black features on them to make them look like what they're supposed to be. Even even the cubes are cargo cubes yes. that are painted uh, silk screen to look like like crates. Yes. And then the wooden resources were all actual um, textured. So like the wood had grain on it. The the stone had little like chips in it and stuff like that, which is, is going to be fantastic for people with um, vision issues because absolutely every piece is uniquely shaped, which is great to see. And I got to say, having all these on the map just looks cool. You end up with you kind of end up with like a 3D village map with like the, the landmarks all sticking out everywhere. Like I almost thinking this would be cool for a D&D game take a picture of the end, end of uh, your game of Castellans of Valeria and be like, here you go. And then, you know, just add a legend pointing to each of the buildings. There you go. Now, at this point, this was only our first play. Um, I will say the big thing is it looks intimidating, but by the third turn, maybe like if we had it down and by the end, it was flowing very quickly. Like our, our last turns were definitely quicker than our first. Those scoring, of course, took longer because there was more things to count. And Sean mentioned that scoring is complicated, but it isn't in a way because literally you just count everything. Like everything's worth one except the windmill, which goes between and it was worth, worth no, half. The, the complicated part was making sure you saw and counted everything yes. properly. Uh, the big thing being the green actually counting as buildings, which we mi- yeah. mixed messed up on possibly once or twice. But yeah, finding majority is generally easy. Whoever has the most pieces has majority, mm-hmm. which is, is nice compared to. Well, citizens are worth one and buildings are worth two and wharfs are worth three. Like you didn't have any of that. So that was cool. Ah, uh, there were there was the, there were half points in there, which is the one yeah, I said the exception. windmills with yeah. the half points. <laughs> windmills go between and count half in each territory, which was a little different. So I, I was impressed. Like, like it's not actually that heavy. Now there are tons of icons. Like I'm talking race for the galaxy level of icons. I would say too many icons. And the rules need work, but this is a prototype specifically we found out after the fact that we were having a problem deciding cards they're going to give you a lore book with this which is kind of cool because i so far dig the valeria world so far and they're going to give you this lore book well i didn't realize i have a prototype copy of this that there's game rules in there that's where all the what it tells you what each of the districts are and what the city is and what each building type is and what it represents which is cool but it also tells you not only what all the citizen cards are but what they do in the game and it not only tells you like what the wharf is, it gives you tips on how to best use the wharf action. And I, I actually complained to the company saying, like, this doesn't make sense. Why would you have a lore book and put game rules in it? Put the game rules in the game rule book. And I've already heard back and they're saying, yeah, we're going to put those in the core rule book. Now, I don't know if it's going to be as well or if they'll be separate. So I'm um, not that I appreciate doing free play testing for people, but it was cool to, that they're actually listening. And I have a feeling it's not going to be a problem when the final game comes out. Absolutely. And I mean, this is this is not, uh, you know, some fly by night company or some, no. some homebrew uh, provider for, you know, they've, they've got a history of making good games. And uh, I think they they show that they do listen to people. Uh, next, we headed back across. I keep saying across the street. Technically, it's two streets. We, we're crossing two streets. There's a, there's there's the crossroads, basically, in Kingsville. And everything's right there. We crossed the street diagonally this time and headed over to the Bandit Goose Brewery. Um, Bandit Goose Brewery is our favorite brewery in Windsor, Essex area. I love their beers. They they are adventurous, but not too much so. Like things don't get weird, which I dig. Not not super hipster, just creative. Yeah, uh, and and a wide variety, which is a huge bonus when we're bringing people there that may not have the same beer taste as us. Now, I did try a new beer of theirs, Rock the Bach, which was quite good. 
Um, Deanna was a little bummed because one of the reasons we actually did this this weekend is they have a seasonal pawpaw beer. Now, pawpaw is a fruit that's native to the area that was thought to be extinct and a local farm is bringing it back. And every year they do a collaboration with Banded Goose and produce a pawpaw sour. Sadly, they didn't have that on tap, but they did have cans. So Deanna was able to pick up some cans of that. And uh, Sean even got a beer trying their lemon sour. And honestly, I loved it. Uh, I enjoy sour candies like the Warheads and such. Uh, and this was a really smooth, refreshing beer with that tart sort of lemony bite on the tongue afterwards that was really refreshing and uh, was a great, uh, a great drink to sit and uh, enjoy a game with. Now, next, uh, we didn't go for any food because we had just eaten breakfast plus breakfast times two kind of thing there. Um, so we got a table in the back. They have a heated patio that's pretty nice. They have this big uh, harvest table. We sat at that. And yes, I know it's a game about wine, and we probably should have like went down the street again, down the street to to, to um, one of the local wineries because we live in the wine region of Ontario. But no, we are at a brewery instead because I prefer beer. And we broke out viticulture. Now, this is the original viticulture. This is technically it's the second printing, which does add the Grande Worker, but this is not the essential edition. We didn't have anything from Tuscany, just the base viticulture game that I bought when it came out. This, I was shocked by how good it still is. Like, I, not that I thought, but like some games don't age well. And back when I got this, I rated it a 10. I would probably still, I might have dropped it to a nine now, mainly for something we'll talk about later. But I still enjoyed this game a lot. And it's one of those, I'm like, I, I have too many games because we should be playing that more often. Yeah, my first time playing, but uh, this game is really well designed. and Just not hard to grasp, despite being a weightier game. Uh, mm -hmm. Knowing the general makeup of the decks will help you but it's not mandatory. You can still have a solid game uh, just sitting down blindly with a, with a good teach. Yeah, it's, it was extremely enjoyable. I, I was glad we played it. I mean, I, I kind of wish we had had a second one, but then I would have been tempted by another round of beers, and that's not a good idea when I am driving everyone around. Um, so then we headed back to Windsor. Um, then we had a meal that totally made up for the failed breakfast and brunch at Georgia Ray's Hot Chicken. Now, this is a well-known uh, Tecumseh restaurant. Just, I, I know people hate it if I call it a suburb of Windsor. <laughs> Nearby town connected to Windsor um, with a place, and it's owned by a couple who are known for opening restaurants. That's just what they do. They open restaurants. They're always good. They, I don't know if they make the menu or they hire fantastic cooks. I'm not sure the details there. But then they get bored. They're like, okay, we've done it. We, we, we had our, they, they had a place called Sweetie's Southern Chicken which did, I don't know, the other type of Southern chicken. This is Nashville hot chicken. So they did sweet teas, and they're like, yeah, okay, let's close this. Let's do a burger place. And they made Mammo Burger Bar, which is fantastic. There's still a second location that's still open, but they're like, eh, we're sick of that. And they opened a place called Fig and Berries. That place was French um, haute couture cuisine, and I'll admit I never went there. It's not my kind of food. So then they, then they put that up for sale and opened uh, Georgia Ray's. Well, now they're sick of it. So Georgia Ray's is up for sale. Um, the thing is, they're really hoping someone will buy it the way Mammo was bought and keep everything, keep the menu, keep the chef, keep it going, and they're going to move on to their next thing. So good luck to them, because so far, they're, they're, they're bat for me, they're batting four out of five. One place wasn't really my style, but whatever. So I wanted to try it before it potentially closed, plus see what all the hype's been. It just never made it out, right? Not enough time. Wait was long, like ex exceedingly long, but then the food made up for it. If the food hadn't been as good, I might have complained. Um, I personally did chicken and waffles. Deanna got their hot chicken sandwich, which is what they're famous for. And Sean got something of his own. Yeah. And, and to be honest, I didn't find the wait all that long myself, but uh, <laughs> possibly just because we were chatting nicely. Uh, I had the pulled pork sandwich uh, alongside a deep fried mac and cheese. Uh, damn fine southern cooking. I, you mm. know, the mac and cheese was amazing. The good. San, you know, the, the pulled pork sandwich with the coleslaw on top, uh, just really good Southern food. Like, yeah, <laughs> you just can't go wrong. Yeah. Best cornbread I've ever had. They're, that cornbread was amazing. Yeah. I wished I'd tried, uh, another side as well as the, the mac and cheese, because I would have liked to have to tried their, their, they've got the pit beans and stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah. D tried the collard greens, thought they were fantastic. 
Yep. Really impressed. I uh, hope to make it back and hopefully someone buys them and keeps them going. Back to the house, we returned to Horizon Zero Dawn. We had left it set up. Blew through a hunt. And it felt good. Like, like it was finally, it didn't take two hours to play through. Everything was starting to fall into place. A uh, lot less rule book referencing. A lot less looking things up. Actually remembering that when you defend, you have to dodge and move. Um, things went much better. Yeah, character choice matters in this game, unfortunately. But then again, so does luck. Uh, you just kind of have to go with it. If you're playing a four-player game, every character is in play, so character choice isn't as much of a matter. But because mm -hmm. we were only playing three, it turns out we probably should have spent a little more time looking at the characters before we picked. Yeah, plus there's a whole thing where, where each character has their own weapon, and when the merchants only have stuff for sale for the character that's not in the game, that gets a little annoying. Now, after this, Deanna's eyes were bugging her. No, she's not fully healed from her surgery. Uh, so Sean and I took advantage of that fact. In addition to the big table in the game room, we have a dining room upstairs that has a table. So we moved upstairs for a bit and we played more Disney. Uh, this time we just put everything on the table and did the full drafting thing. I ended up drafting Jack, Buzz Lightyear, and Fusilier. And I grabbed uh, Moana, Demona, and Elsa. I, I gotta say my combo kind of worked. It, it, I, I enjoyed Buzz. I had seen Sean play Buzz earlier the, the, or the day before, and I'm like, no, Buzz Lightyear's neat. I really do dig the the multi range. I especially like his hit someone one square away, two square away, three, and then his power that as long as he stays exactly two squares away from someone, he can damage them again. I found that really powerful. Um, still couldn't get Jack's move token thing going. I don't know. That, that, that seems like a, a more difficult character to learn how to use well. I didn't really get that going. I just, I, and I couldn't get carrot status tokens to stick on the team Sean played, which some of that has to do with the characters. And Fusilier was a lot of fun. I hadn't actually personally played Fusilier, having only played against him. And holy cow, status effects and making your opponent discard cards, he can be pretty nasty. Yeah, while I was trying to combo Moana and Elsa's movements along while, well, while being able to use Demona's range attacks, which is what she's known for, but I just couldn't get a vibe going, and that Jack Fusilier team was mm. really rough on me. So, Motif, yeah, I think uh, that was the most unbalanced game we've had so far. Yeah, that was the first time where it's been like, you, I can't win. This is, we're going to call it here. You, <laughs> you took it. Yeah, whereas the game before, Sean was like, I'm doomed, I'm done, I'm doomed, I'm yep. done, and I won. win. <laughs> yeah. Which is kind of how that game often plays, I yep. find. Yep. Now, after D's nap, she joined us, and we finished off our final hunts in Horizon Zero Dawn. Now, I will say it felt a little easy by the end, and I think a big part of that had to do with what came out at the merchants, who got to buy what. Um, Deanna had armor of ridiculousness. She basically could walk around and taunt all the monsters and stand there and just soak damage and take nothing. Now, personally, I think that was just luck of the draw. And the comboed well with the fact she was getting a lot of bonus scrap for things she was doing. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it was overpowering or not. Uh, one thing to note, this is a competitive game and it's not like she won. So there is that aspect. But I will say, I think she was playing more cooperatively than the game intends. So that might have been part of it. Um, in the end, Deanna was like, no, I would rather play this cooperatively, which I understand. I, competitive games or however people want to call them, competitive game, cooperative games with winners don't always go over well. And this game, I think to be enjoyable is meant to be played competitively. I think you're supposed to steal the kills and you're supposed to do the things. Yeah, it, it's sort of, but not really co-op. I mean, if we hadn't worked together at all, we never would have finished the game. Yeah, there's no way. Uh, there's no way. Uh, but then again, the end fight was a bit of a letdown because we were just overmatched. I mean, between D's armor, D, D was able to soak melee. I was able to soak ranged. And, you know, I had I just I, you you, do, you dodged in and, and back out again while yeah. I had a pretty killer ranged attack. I mean, I was able to do like ridiculous amounts of ranged damage. So I just stole kills. That's that's what I did. I, <laughs> I, I was the jerk who, who yeah. went in. You did all the damage. D soaked all the damage. I snuck in, hit a guy, cut the credit and rolled out. Yeah. Now, I will admit there was one move in the end game where my character was unconscious. And then I played this sneak attack thing where I played dead. That that was pretty awesome. 
<laughs> actually that 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 I don't know was fitting to the theme of the game. Now we are going to be record re, uh, reviewing this one later in our review segment. So for those of you listening at home or watching live, stick around for that. Uh, for those of you watching this segment on YouTube, jump over to our review when you're done here to find out more about Horizon Zero Dawn. Now, we finished up Saturday with a couple of beers and Castle Panic. Again, we've got a copy, uh, thanks to Fireside Games, of the new big box for the second edition. At this point, Sean had never played. so And I don't think he ever watched like Will Wheaton play on tabletop, so didn't have a lot of knowledge of the game, if any. So we played the base game again and lost terribly. Like, I was there 15 tokens left in the bag, I think, plus Something everything like was out? Yeah. Like, I, I don't get it. Like, why Why is this game so, so hard for us? Everyone else seems to think it's easy. I, I, I was on the on my phone and Googling and, you know, we're doing something wrong. And people are like, oh, this game is just too easy. You need the expansions to make it difficult. We've played 20 times and never lost. Like, what? And we got crushed. I mean, it, yeah. there was just no hope of us None. even considering winning. We probably could have you know, quit 10 minutes or 20 minutes sooner (laughs) and had the same, but because it was just, there was no way we were going to win. Yeah. We can't figure if people are house ruling it. If people are misunderstanding a rule, do the dice hate us? Are we somehow cheating against ourselves? I don't know. If you're a castle panic expert, please let us know in the comments and, and, and tell Ask us if we've been doing something that you know that people do wrong because yes, it's yeah. Now I will say there is a thread on Reddit where people are talking about when you use an archer, you hit everything in the arc. That's wrong. We double check that. So that might be why people are winning 20 times without losing is because they're attacking every monster in an arc with one card, which is not right. We have confirmed that we double checked it. Cause I'm like, wow, that would make things easier. And yeah, I'm kind of tempted to play that way to see if we win, but that is not by the rule. You only get to hit one monster per card, um, except as like boulders and stuff. But like your generic, you know, your swordsman doesn't hit everything in the blue arc. (laughs) So that was the only thing we could find online is it seemed like a lot of people were playing that wrong somehow. But even with that, I mean, even in threads where people weren't discussing incorrect rules like that, they all seemed to think it was too easy. Yeah, And I, I don't get that. Maybe it's terrible luck. I, I have no idea. So anyway, Castle Panic, the, the hardest co-op I've ever played so far, it seems. Like, we're going to have to grab ghost stories for an easy experience after this. So that was it for Saturday night. The next morning, we got out. We headed out for brunch to after getting a bit of work done. Uh, went to a place uh, nice and close to me called Edda's Greeklish Eatery. This is a place that's been around for a while. It replaced the Honey Badger Bistro. Loved it when it opened. Um, it was a Greek couple that owned it, serving what they call Greeklish food. And it was like Greek fusion with local Canadian food and some pierogies and stuff in there too. Kind of kind of a weird mix of food. I dig it. Like Greeklish, that's a neat term. We love the place. But then I think it was during COVID, they ended up selling the place to buy out a local shoe store. So whatever, owners want to run a shoe store. It's actually a fantastic shoe store. If you have kids in Windsor, Essex, go to Karen's for Kids to get your shoes. <laughs> uh, no, this is not a sponsored post. <laughs> um, so when they sold it, they sold it to some new owners. And I was concerned that, that there's no way that Edis could be as good as it was. So this was our first time actually going back. And I've got to say, food-wise, it was as good as ever. Yeah, it this, was. Yeah, this is definitely a new morning breakfast joint worth remembering uh you know every part of the food and the service and you know the friendly the friendly people coming out and making sure everything's great it mm-hmm. was it was just a really uh great restaurant and a nice way to make up for the one that we no longer go to because of <laughs> their chosen politics well yes there is that too uh yeah at any time the you know chef comes out to make sure everything's all good and is friendly about it that, that's always good to see so yeah, big friend of Edda's, if you stopped going like us because it got new owners, don't don't be concerned. Go check it out. I do worry they're doing badly because they have like a handwritten sign in the window that says all day breakfast, which to me is kind of a, a cry for help. Like, hey, come eat here. Go back. Go eat there. It's it's great food. I will admit not cheap. It's not, you know, cheap breakfast, It's it, but it's good hearty breakfast. Um, the, the, Some of the best eggs Benedict I've ever had. And I got to say, I love the skillets. 
And Deanna's favorite is that you can get potato pancakes with things instead of hash browns. Like like Greek, I, I don't remember, maslaka or something. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. But the, the Greek potato pancakes instead of your usual potato is the big draw for Deanna. Uh, mostly, we talk shop. Like, uh, that was a, a big part of our Sunday was sitting and enjoying some coffee. There are some things we're trying different. Um, we're testing a couple things in regards to podcast downloads. Um, nothing big that people have to worry about, like no big changes coming to the show or anything like that. Um, the, the biggest change might be if Sean actually does change what we are looking at right now and how our windows are displayed and in, in our look for our podcast. But like just talking about generic things, uh, how what we're going to review next, what we're going to do over our reviews. Um, you may see less unboxings in the future. But that's about it. Nothing, nothing major, but enough stuff, stuff we need to talk about. Badly or perhaps not, reviewing games is just not all fun and games, uh, mm -hmm. especially when it's one of your primary sources of income. Yeah. Uh, sadly, you can't pay your tax bill with a box full of meeple. Anyone want used review copies? I, I can't send those to the, the, the Canadian Revenue Agency, unfortunately. So next we got back to the house and it was time to keep working towards one of my goals for the weekend. So we upgraded my copy of Viticulture to the Essential Edition. Now, this didn't mean going and buying the Essential Edition. That's what I was trying to avoid doing because it ends up the Essential Edition is the original second edition of Viticulture with the Tuscany expansion mixed and matched. So some of the stuff from Tuscany is added. And I have both expansions. I sadly hadn't really dove I've dove in, gotten into Tuscany much. We'd only unlocked a few things in there. And a lot of what we had to add, I hadn't even unlocked yet or seen. So it was a matter of opening packages and stuff. And I got to say, like, I get it. Stonemeyer wants you to just go by the Essential Edition. And for anyone nowadays, if you buy the game, you're not going to have this problem because you buy the Essential Edition. But it was a bit annoying to, to update. More annoying than I thought. Yeah, better instructions on how to upgrade could have made this so much easier. Because it wasn't yeah. a hard process. It was the instructions that made it tedious. Yeah, the biggest problem was adding in the new visitor cards. All they had to say was add in all the new visitor, new visitor cards from Tuscany, add the ones from uh, one other part of Tuscany. I can't remember what it was called, a knowledgeist or Arborist. something. Arborist, there you go. Yeah, add in all the new visitors from the Arborist and the new visitor cards. That's all they had to say. Instead, they sent a spreadsheet. And it was alphabetical. And we looked at the list that said essential. We looked at the list and we went through card by card. I gave my phone to Deanna, blew it up nice and big. And she just read off each one. And like, I had the stack of new cards. Sean had the stack of old cards. We went through it all. And in the end, we just used all of them. And I'm like, all you had to tell me was add all the new visitors from Tuscany, add in all the ones from the Arbor and done. We yeah. would have been done in <laughs> 10 minutes you know two, instead, sen two sentences instead of instead of spreadsheets yeah uh, talk I'd, about I'd, making things way more difficult i mean maybe if there was something different in first edition but i still no that, that was, was another column on the spreadsheet oh. so if we had first edition it would have been it would have been different so yeah I, a little unimpressed by that so like i said not a problem for the average person your average person go you just go by viticulture you get the essential this is done for you um that played, we played it, right? We did the upgrade. I wanted to see what how is essential compared to the original. And oh my gosh, it's it's there's a reason he put it out as the essential edition. The I I already loved the game, but this was better. Um biggest thing was more money at the start of the game. Another thing I loved asymmetric abilities. You combine a mama and a papa card, or now they're called blue and red. Sorry. In my edition, they're called mama and papa cards. Add a blue and red card and gives you different stuff than everyone else. And it's going to be random because those decks were significant. And the, the odds, I don't even think you could have two players with the actual start. Um, that gave you some starting resources or cards or vines. And honestly, it felt like the same feel we had for using Prelude with Terraforming Mars. It, it gives you a resource boost. It gets the game going and it gives you a bit of direction. Like if you start with a, you know, whatever, a four red wine in your hand, you're like, okay, I should try to focus on reds because that's what I start with. And step one is going to be to build the trellis to plant this. And now I know what I'm going to do. Cause I will say the day before we played viticulture and I complained a bit that at the beginning, it just, it's, it's a slow build. Like you, you don't have any vines yet. And you're also scripted because every player starts with a Pinot wine that requires a vine or a, a trellis. And it's like, 
every player the turn one or two has got to build the trellis so they need the money to build the trellis and so it kind of scripted that was all fixed in the essential edition yeah now as usual i did much better the first time than before with the, the, uh, <laughs> than with the essential edition but that's actually how almost all games go for me yes. every time I just do better on my first ga uh, game when I can't possibly overthink them. Yes. <laughs> uh, so no surprises there, but it was no, no, it was absolutely solid. And the red and the blue cards do make for such a better yeah. flow to that game. You don't sort of feel like you're not doing anything for an entire mm. year. Uh, yeah. Just sort of waiting for that second year to come around so you can do things this way you've got that start in that first year you are hitting yep. the ground running you know you got a little bit of mom of money for mom and dad to start your vineyard rather than you know being out there in the fields digging with your hands yes plus there's other additional rules there like the ability to sell your fields i can't think of a game we played since where someone didn't sell a field for that extra money at the beginning so i gotta say that was cool now the reason all this viticulture play happened is I have been sitting on a copy of Viticulture World for way too long at this point. Stonemaier games we usually hammer through, and one of the biggest problems is you won't send me anything new until I review this. No, <laughs> that is part of it. Um, so I've been looking forward to trying now. What this is, is this is the cooperative expansion for Viticulture, which, of course, makes it cooperative. That's, that's what it does. But I got to say, it is quite different from Viticulture while still being Viticulture. We played Green Gully. So what this gives you is a bunch of different regions of the world that you can go try to make wine in. And in this particular case, it's like the easy intro, get to learn the game expansion, which again goes to our topic of onboarding, which comes up now and then of good onboarding. Like it did a really good job of making sure you tried the new things and see the things you have to do. And I also got to say, I, I, I liked the Charterstone tie in for people who played Charterstone. That's a cute Easter egg. Uh, and the fantastic thing is your meeple get hats. This yes. is fantastic. You get summer and winter hats. You're, you no longer have uh, a, or you're no longer, you know, adding meeple in throughout the game by buying them. You have meeple at the start, but mm -hmm. until they lose their hats, they are only temporary workers and not fully available to use all of the benefits of the game. And they are the yep. rubber hats that fit right on your meeple uh and are really sort of cute and adorable yep now yeah. it, i did like that yep yeah. good good depending on uh, on how well you know viticulture um the intro which again is, is a fantastic onboarding but if you are familiar with viticulture at first especially it feels a little bit too handholdy um mm -hmm. it's it's but it does turn out that at the end, it's actually important <laughs> that it's been holding your hand and, and ushering you along because it was a nail biter and they expected it to be. Yep. It was very clear that they knew you were going to be desperately trying to figure out how to get the last couple of points, dollars, fame, etc. in order to crawl all past that goal before the end of the game. Now, the big surprise for me here, um, I guess I just don't pay enough attention to stuff because I get surprised by games too often. This was not the legacy expansion I thought it was. Now, I will say, I don't think I ever saw Jamie or Stonemeyer calling this a legacy expansion, but I definitely saw uh, other people, other gamers saying this is the, the legacy expansion. Oh, it's a legacy version. This is not a legacy game in, in any way whatsoever. And honestly, I feel bad we hadn't gotten to this game sooner. But I thought this, even if it wasn't right on cards, destroy things, needed a said steady group, that there was some form of campaign here. But it's not. This isn't even a campaign game. This is each region you visit is a standalone game. And the permanent improvements you make are for that game in that region. Once you play another region, your board wipes like you're using the same board. So really, this is a scenario based co-op game not a legacy game or a campaign game at all. Yeah, absolutely. And this is uh, annoying because it could have gotten to the table so much sooner because yeah. there wasn't any concern for needing that stable weekly group that we were going to be able to get to week in and week out over and over again. Uh, turns out that was completely unnecessary. Yeah. 
And like I said, I'm not sure where the miscommunication was, where I, where I got the impression I did have on this. So we could have dived into this one way sooner. Plus, I'm not going to worry about spoilers. This yeah. isn't a legacy game where you're unlocking anything. Yeah, now, absolutely. I will admit, I don't know if I want to talk about um, each event that happens in each of the regions. I think people are going to want to discover those. But I think those would still be kind of spoilers. But again, it's spoiling a story game in a way more than spoiling like nothing mechanical. I'm not giving you clues. Nothing's going to make it easier for you. It just I, you might want to be surprised by some of the things that are going to happen. Um, I'm only calling them permanent upgrades because that's what they call them in the book. They call them you want to do permanent upgrades and they're permanent in the fact that they're there for the rest of that game. But yes, when you start a new game or you switch to a new scenario, that's all wiped and you got to start over. And it's not even like each region has new improvements. Well, who knows? Maybe they'll have something in there, but there's no more tokens left. So, you know, looking ahead, it sure seems like it's the same. And I got to say, I was impressed. Like it, it was fun. It was, it was quite the puzzle. Um, there, I, I, what it surprised me is it seemed like there was very little quarterbacking where there could have been. Like there was just something about it where you all kind of seemed to be doing our own thing mainly. Like we'd, we'd, we'd be like, you got to do this and this, but the rest of your turn, you know, do yeah, whatever. Absolutely. I mean, you, there's a lot of different ways to improve your vineyard. Uh, you know, you, you've got a lot of options and you're all aiming for the same goal. But just like in a normal game of viticulture, there are different paths to get to that goal, depending yeah. on what vines you have, what, uh, you know, what orders you have, what uh, what visitors might have dropped by. It's there's a lot to it. And so I'm, until you get you're getting towards that end and you're like, oh, OK, look, you need to get some more. Yeah. You need uh, to get some more victory points. Like, like, there's no reason not to say it. You need to have a set amount of influence, and you need to, each player has to hit 25 points. And if anyone's played the original Viticulture, 25 used to be the max you could get. And there are not many games. None of the games we played before this did anyone get to 25. I don't think that's a, that's a spoiler for anything. So I got to say, I was impressed. I'm just a little frustrated, because like, there is no reason we couldn't have broke this out at any time. There's no reason I can't bring it to the barbershop bar our next event and play it with a brand new group that's never played viticulture before. So I think they'll have a hard time if you've never played <laughs> viticulture. Yeah. But I will just to, to comment on the, it feeling tense. There was a point where I was like, do we just suck at viticulture? Like, 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 like we're not going to make this. There is no way we're going to like, like, yeah, we all played against each other, but maybe we all sucked equally. So our viticulture games were close. Cause I gotta say that first game we played at um, Bandit Goose, I think we were all within one point of each other at the end. Yeah. I think it was 23, 22, 21. Yeah. Which is really cool. So that was it. That was the last game we played. Um, not a huge number of games, but you have to realize that those horizon zero dawn probably totaled 10 hours. If you include setup, takedown, take down sorting cards and all the extra say and teaching the rules to Deanna, I would say we spent 10 hours this weekend playing that. So that is an epic game that I'm glad we didn't try to squeeze in all into one game night. Yeah. Overall, though, Sean Khan had great food, great homes, games. And I went home feeling like we had accomplished a huge yes. amount, both in play and you know business discussions about the uh, the channel. Yeah, it was great. I, I honestly think we need to do this more often because um, it got us to actually buckle down, get in a bunch of games. Uh, it was great for the pile of obligation and, say, and shame. The, the, like the Viticulture, I hadn't touched my Viticulture copy in forever. I finally got to try with the Essentials. We got a brand new game off the pile of shame and obligation. We got in more plays of the Disney expansion so we can talk about them more intelligently with more opinions on them. Sean got to try Castle Panic for the first time. Like That's a lot for one weekend. And I would love to do these a little more often. Like I don't know, every other month or whatever, but I'd like to at least... Like we called this one spring. So if we can at least do a summer, fall and winter, I'll be happy. Maybe we can squeeze in a bit more. But that is going to be all for now. Yes. Now we're normally here to answer your gaming game night questions. You can get questions to us by going to tabletopbellhop.com, clicking on Ask the Bellhop, or send an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to a detailed review of Horizon Zero Dawn the board game from Steamforge Games, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy of this video game-based board game. Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game, was designed by Sherwin Matthews and features art from the Gorilla Miniature Games Art Department, 
Thomas Lishman and Doug Telford. It was published in 2020 after a very successful Kickstarter. This board game version of Horizon Zero Dawn plays one to four players. A full game consists of five hunts, each of which takes an hour or two. The game is appropriate for players 12 and up and is rather heavy with lots of little fiddly rules. Now, Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game, focuses on one aspect of the video game, the Hunter's Lodge. Here you take on the role of a hunter heading out on a quest. You and your fellow hunters will be competing to see who can earn the most glory through a series of five hunts, culminating in the Hunter's Call, where you'll try to take down your prey. In this base game, that prey is the legendary Sawtooth. Along the way, you'll earn Sons for Glory, level up your hunters, meet merchants, and approve your equipment. In the end, the hunter with the most sons will be named the first among equals. That is, if you survive. Now, for a look at the fantastic miniatures and other stuff you get, check out our Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game unboxing video on YouTube. Now, here you'll see everything you get, including some really top-notch miniatures. Thick, double-sided modular boards, a wide variety of counters and tokens, and tons of cards. Now, these cards include a deck for each of the four hunters, large machine information cards, machine behavior cards, merchant decks, a deck of salvage cards, an event deck, and a tracking deck. There's also a rather thick rulebook and eight custom dice, all tucked into a plastic insert. Now, while this insert was great for getting the game into our hands in good shape, mm -hmm. it's not great for organizing all the stump stuff once you have played. No, unfortunately not. Now, one thing component-wise of note is just how small the Hunter miniatures are. Now, I understand this was done to be able to keep everything in scale so the monsters were appropriately sized. Sorry, the machines, machine monsters. I, I get it. If you'd made them standard, you know, 32 millimeter scale or your standard heroic scale miniatures, the Sawtooth probably wouldn't have fit in the box. So I do understand it, but you're not going to be able to get these miniatures and say use them with your other D&D or Warhammer miniatures in RPGs or games. They're pretty much sized specifically for this board game. So what are we doing with these small minis and other components? Let's move on to an overview of play. So step one in playing Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game, is to pick what you want to hunt. The thing is, this box only comes with one hunt, one option. There are a ton more hunts unlocked during the Kickstarter, but with just this box, you will be working to complete the same hunt every time you play, and that's a hunt for the Sawtooth. Next, each player picks a hunter. There are four of these in the box, representing familiar cultures from the video game series. Grab all the stuff for this hunter, like the minis, card deck, and skill token, Sort your action deck, finding all of the zero-level cards, and place your starting cards on the table, including your hunter ability, initial weapons, armor, and starting resource. Next, you enter the tracking phase, where the leader, who is the oldest or most experienced player for the first hunt, draws the top three cards of the encounter deck and picks which encounter the group will have first. I think more games need the start player to be the person who knows the game best. I do appreciate that not just as a rule teacher. Now the board is set up, like the, the playing board is set up based on the card that was chosen. It's made up of two to four of the game boards, each of which is going to be on a side based on the player count. You're then going to seed that with machines as well as other scenery tokens. Players then place their hunters onto the edge of the starting board. Now at this point, it's time for the first actual hunt, which is played through in what they call the encounter phase. You'll be playing through five of these, including the hunter's call, which is the final battle, versus your chosen adversary. One note, when you're laying out the boards, do pay careful attention to their orientation mm -hmm. on the table. This makes a huge difference, as well as the player count on each side of the board. Yes, note the boards say 2A. 2A is the same board as the other side. There is not, I assume the first time we played, that 2A was one side and 2B would be the other side of the same board, and it's not. So we messed up our player count during our first experience with this game. Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game, is a busy game with a lot going on and lots mm -hmm. of variables and things to track. Due to this, what follows will only be a vague overview of how the game plays without getting into the actual details. This isn't meant to be a how to play, but rather give you and your group a good idea of how things play out so you can make your own decision on whether or not to dive deeper. 
So each turn of an encounter has a number of phases, which starts with the active character taking two actions. These actions include sprinting, which lets you move two squares, but alerts all past machines along your path. Sneaking, which lets you move only one square, but doesn't alert adjacent machines. Craft, which lets you cycle your discards back into your deck and acts as a form of healing. Distract, which lets you toss a rock and move a machine. And finally, making an attack, of which there are two types, ranged and melee. Attacks are made by rolling the custom dice and looking for hit symbols with various boosts being added by action cards from the player's hands. These can give more dice, give re-rolls, allow for additional actions. There is also a critical hit symbol on some of the dice, which will trigger special effects on your equipment or cards. Mm -hmm. Similar to the video game, attacks can cause various elemental effects like fire, ice, and shock damage. There are also rules for trap weapons and area of effect attacks. Now, when attacking most machines, you have a choice. You can either try to take out the machine itself or try to knock off components, something you'll be very familiar with two players of the video game. Both give glory, but removing components can make machines easier to defeat and or give you access to additional scrap. Now, after the active hunter takes their two actions, it's time for those machines to go. Machines start off non-alert and stay that way until they get attacked. They take damage from some other source. An alert enemy is in their square. A hunter is in their square. A hunter is in an adjacent square that doesn't contain tall grass. Or a hunter sprints by them. Non-alert enemies follow the paths laid out on the board. If these paths lead them off the map, that machine is considered to have escaped. Alert enemies instead follow what it says on their behavior cards. Now, each behavior card features a branching path of actions that the active machine will take, and this branching path is often based on set conditions, like is the machine still carrying cargo, or is there a hunter within one square, and so on. Now, while going through the path and the cards, the machines will end up moving about the board, alerting other enemies, and, of course, attacking your hunters. Now, when a machine attacks, there's no dice rolled for the machine. It just does a set amount of damage, but this damage can be mitigated by a defense roll. This, the player rolls using dice based on the armor they're wearing. Now, as part of defending, the hunter also must dodge to a new square. Now, I'm calling this out because we completely forgot this rule, not only the first time we played, but most often while playing the game, often forgot to move that dodge. When a hunter is damaged, they have to discard cards from their hand and then their deck. If their deck is ever empty, they are knocked out. Knocked out hunters miss a turn, lose any earned glory, and come back with a fully shuffled deck the next round. Now, this isn't too big a penalty, actually. Getting knocked out isn't horrible in this game, but you do have to watch out because if the number of hunters that get knocked out over the entire hunt ever matches the player count of your group, you fail the hunt and get no reward. Now, unless this is the final hunt against the Sawtooth, you do get to continue. You just move on to the next hunt. You don't need to win every hunt to win the game, but you're going to miss out on leveling up and scrap and things you're going to want for that final fight. Now, once all machines go, there is a maintenance step. You determine if you've lost or won the hunt and continue on to the next player's turn if you haven't. Hunts are won by defeating a set number of machines based on the encounter card the leader chose. Once players get to this total, they have the option to continue or to take out any remaining machines in an effort to get some bonus scrap. Now, after an encounter, you enter what's called the campfire phase, which starts with awarding players sun tokens based on the total glory they got in the last hunt, with the most suns going to the player with the most glory, who also gets the leader token. The fledgling token is given to the player who scored the least glory and is a big catch-up mechanic in this game. Next, players level up their hunters if the encounter they just finished is a higher level than they are. Mm -hmm. Every character has a unique talent tree, and players will pick one of the two options at each level. These will include new cards that are added to the hunter's action deck, new permanent abilities, or perhaps new equipment. Now, the last part of the camping step is for everyone to go shopping. A set of cards is drawn from the appropriate level merchant deck and players get to spend the scrap they gathered for new equipment, ammo, weapons, and modifiers for their existing gear. The merchant stock refreshes after each purchase, and while the leader gets first pick, the fledgling gets to buy for first item for free. 
No, the, your deck size is limited by your level, so buying more stuff does not give you more health. Now, after camping, it's time to move on to the next hunt. Unless you've reached the hunter's call card, on the fifth and final hunt, the leader, who may be new, draws three encounter cards and picks one. The fledgling then draws three event cards, picks one, and you move on to the next encounter. Now, the final hunt is represented by that hunter's call card, which is face up on the table, taunting you for the entire thing. It features a bigger board with your chosen prey on it. Now, the leader has no choices to make for this encounter. You all have to do the, the hunter's call. But the fledging does get to play an event card, giving them one final advantage in the final fight. Now, this final battle actually plays out the same as any previous battle, with two exceptions. For one, hunters that take down one of the hunted machines, in this case the Sawtooth, gets a bonus half sun. Plus, if the hunters fail at this hunt, everyone loses the game. No one wins. Now, assuming your team is able to take down their final prey, they earn suns as in a normal victory step, and then the player with the most suns is declared the winner. Now, in addition to playing competitively, which is the default way to play Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game, you also have a cooperative variant. Now here, players are encouraged to work together and take down the machines together, but if any one hunter is knocked out even once in a single hunt, you lose. Now there's also a variant rule that allows the trading of items between players during the campfire phase that can be used when playing cooperatively or competitively. I think that's a pretty good overview of play. It's time to move on to our thoughts on this licensed board game. So let me start by talking about the license. I am a huge fan of Horizon Zero Dawn, the video game. I don't play a lot of video games. I play them now and then, and I almost never play them when they're the new hotness, and I hardly ever finish a game. Well, I did play Horizon Zero Dawn when it was relatively new. I loved every moment of it, finished the full game, as well as the downloadable content, and 100%ed both. Yes, that included earning all the dang blazing suns. Now, I, on the other hand, never played the game, and knew nothing about it when sitting down to play this board game version. Now, I will say as a fan of the video game, I did have some trepidation about the board game version. But I was curious about it and jumped at the chance to review it, so thanks for the opportunity, Streamforge. Now, I didn't expect much. I was expecting a licensed game that had cool stuff from the video game and probably was okay to play. I was pleased to learn that not only is Horizon Zero Dawn the board game a great representation of at least part of the video game, it's just a very solid, thematic, Ameritrash dice chucking game with lots of player agency and really cool character customization. If you don't have a clue what Horizon Zero Dawn is, that's fine. You're mm -hmm. going to kill things and try not to die. If you're into that sort of game, you can learn about the license as you go, and it won't impact your enjoyment if you don't know in advance. Now, what impressed me the most was the way that the designer decided to make a game out of the video game, and that was by focusing on just one part of Horizon Zero Dawn, which is the Hunter's Lodge. This is a brilliant way to let players explore a part of the world without having to live up to the epic nature of the whole open world game and its massive setting. Taking on the role of a small group of hunters about to head out on a hunt to take down one of the game's legendary beasts just fits perfect for a board game theme. If anything, not knowing the ins and outs of the world meant I wasn't distracted and could more easily focus on power, skills, and tactics. Though knowing a little bit about the behavior of the monsters in the video game would have allowed me to perhaps better anticipate what some of the monsters' AI mechanics would be. Still, that wasn't any real advantage or disadvantage in the long term over the full hunt. Yeah, I will say those behavior cards that we described while covering the game do have the machines act as you would expect them to act if you played the video game, which is something I never even thought when teaching the game that I might want to point out to the other players who haven't played it. Now, I got to say, by limiting the scope of the game, I think that made it possible for Steam Forge and their development team to kind of nail down the mechanics for this one thing, hunting machines. That's what you're focusing on. And that step, so the three steps of tracking phase, encounter phase, and campfire phase does give you that feel of being part of a hunter party, as well as the interplay between the characters in a party of all vying for dominance, which is a big part of the story of the video game and, and people trying to outdo each other. 
Plus, the epic nature of the quest is further reinforced through the amount of game time it takes to play. Though some might be overwhelmed by just how epically long it can be. Yeah. Now, the time on the box is for one portion of a hunt. The real playtime is five times that length. Yeah. While thematic and feeling epic, this is honestly what I think is going to be the biggest problem with this game for potential game groups. The overall length. While the rule book notes you can finish the entire game in one night, I can't see many groups wanting to do that. Each individual encounter phase was taking us an hour or two. Then there's the additional time required to shop, level up, customize your decks, and just get things set up and get the miniatures on the board and sort the tokens and get the encounter deck shuffled. You're looking at, I would say, six to ten hours to complete a full game of Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game. That alone is going to scare many game groups away. I honestly think this isn't even made even remotely clear until no. you get going with the game, which is unfortunate as it could sour players on it, even if they were enjoying themselves on that first hunt. Some just might not want to leave a game set up for the time required to finish. Now, I'll admit the first time we sat down, it was the three of our four of us with Tori and Kat. I had no clue. That's what we were signing up for was this massive game. The box said two hours, one to two hours. And if you have first game, I'll double it. Four hours. We have a four hour game night. We can easily fit this in. And we only managed to fit in three hunts. And I think we played for about six hours. So, yeah, it's not initially obvious just how long this game is. And unfortunately, there's no real good way to save between hunts. I played many other board games that have this type of gameplay where multiple things have to happen. But there's some kind of save mechanic. Now, yes, you could put the boards and the machines and the various card decks. You don't need out because they're going to change for the next hunt. So you can put those away. But you need to keep track of things like which cards from each action deck players have unlocked. Once you've hit level one, you've added some cards to your deck. Where you are on your skill tree, which branching path did you take? What sc scrap have you gathered? What do you have left? How many suns have you earned? Well, the glory clears at the end. The suns carry over till the final scoring. Now, I will say what I would normally do in this case would just baggies. Every player gets another baggie. You put your your current deck in one baggie. You put your still to earn cards in another baggie. You put your scrap in a baggie and put it all in. But then that box insert, there's no space to, to put separated out components. This insert is designed to store the mini so they don't get damaged. It's not great for sorting everything else in the game. You just basically it wants you to put in your whole stack of cards in one compartment and all your components in another. Now, of course, none of this is a problem if you are lucky enough to have a game space where you can leave the game set up and return to it later. Now, if your group doesn't mind signing up for a potential 10 hour game experience, quite possibly split over multiple nights, there is a lot to like in Horizon Dawn, Zero Dawn, the board game. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I really like is the mixture of thematic dice driven adventure game with light deck construction. Now, not, not deck building. You're not shuffling through your deck. This is pre-constructed deck before you start each encounter. Now, the system here is kind of like a hybrid of dungeon crawl, moves and attacks, and taking out the monsters using custom dice and card-driven combat just by how much each of the hunter's action deck can modify play. Now, the biggest one you're going to see right at the beginning of the game is to fire your ranged weapon. You need ammo cards, which combo with your weapon. But you don't actually need to use cards on your turn. But we did find out pretty quickly in order to do well on a hunt, it's going to take figuring out the best use of every card in that action deck. When can they be used and actually using them up, even though they're your health. And this is really one of the interesting aspects of the, the semi co-op sort of idea of the game. The customization when buying gear means you can choose to help yourself at the expense of others or mm -hmm. be nice and make sure your whole hunting party has what it needs to bring down the beasts. Now, I also love how asymmetric each hunter is, though I got to say some seem more useful than others in this hunt. Uh, in particular, the Karja warriors seem to be the most difficult to play well, though I admit for competitive play, they're awesome at stealing kills out of the nose of other players. Now, further adding to the asymmetry when leveling up, you get to follow a customization tree that allows two different paths. And then that path branches to two different options, and that path branches to two different options. 
And I love the fact that the next time I play, I could play a Karja Warrior again, and it could feel completely different. Even with this, though, I do wish there were just more hunters in the core box, kind of like I wish there were more monsters. I just would love to see more variety because with the base box, playing four players, you're stuck with the same four characters every time. And the skill tree really does make for some devilishly hard choices. Mm -hmm. You know uh, early on that you're going to have to pick between a growing number of cool abilities and pick a path that eliminates some in order to gain others. Yeah, when you're at the final level, you're only getting one out of three choices, and that, that just feels rough. And I got to say, after I picked my first thing, I looked ahead in my deck and I was like, oh, I can't possibly get this. And this looks awesome. Now, speaking of variety, I can't help but mention the sawtooth in the room, right? My biggest disappointment with this particular box is the fact you get one hunt. Now, not only that, but this base hunt is for, I don't know, it's a sawtooth. Like, it, it's it's... It's the big first jump scare, the big first scary monster you see in the intro to the game. It's just, it's not that impressive. Yeah, it's kind of neat. You get the first one and the first box comes with the first monster. But if you're playing through Horizon Zero Dawn and you finish the game, a big hunt for a sawtooth, just doesn't get my blood, blood pumping. That said, this box did make me want to go pick up expansions so we could hunt other monsters. Frankly, again, as someone not knowing the game, I found the crab-like creatures much more terrifying and concerning, though that might be in part due to the fact that we ran into them before we had powered up as much as when we hit the sawtooths. I, they are in Timmy, the shell walkers. And plus, they were the, putting that fight out was great because it was a good way to get extra gear. But again, you get that competitive cooperative thing. Competitively, you want to steal that crate off the back of those before anyone else does. So I did like those. But yeah, I, the crab walkers were definitely... They damaged us way more than that. That, I think, was our hardest encounter of the entire thing was, I think it was a level two encounter with crab walker or shell walkers. Now, after our last play, even my Euro loving wife was online checking out what else there is to offer. So I got to say, if, if Steam Forge's goal was, uh, here's a taste like uh, here, fight a sawtooth. You're going to like this and leave you wanting more. It worked. Now, for me, not knowing what else there is in the Horizon world, like what I might be missing out on, I enjoyed it and I would play it again, but I wasn't eager for more and hungry to see what other beasties you could fight uh, because there is replayability to some degree True. within this uh, within this box. Yeah, and I will say the leader system of picking which uh, which encounter to do, like we used one third of each encounter. Like, I, so there's what, 15 times more? possibilities of what we could have fought that we didn't see so it's not like I'm, I'm not trying to say it's not replayable i just that whole i think part of it is the instruction book says choose a hunt and then goes the only hunt you get is the sawtooth i'm like don't say choose a hunt just say this is a hunt for sawtooth and maybe i'd feel differently about it now another concern worth mentioning and i think we've already kind of covered it is this is a thematic dice chucker and due to that randomness of the dice will be a factor every game while there is a bit of mitigation, this is a highly random Amerithrash style game. This is especially true during the first couple of encounters because your low level equipment just doesn't build very big dice pools. Uh, at the most, I think we were rolling three dice at the beginning. You're going to spend a lot of time planning out your attack and trying to do it. No, we're going to make sure we're stealthy so it doesn't get armor just to roll badly and do nothing. This is going to turn some people off, though I have to say, that's what, what else did you expect? That's the type of game this is. Now, thankfully, the advancement and shopping system does help overcome some of the randomness. So while you might no longer miss, you might not do enough damage to achieve what it is you wanted. Yeah. You're not usually whipping away wildly in those later parts, though. That is true. Now, while playing, we did run into a few things as we got further, and you got that leveling up and more equipment that just didn't seem to make sense. Now, one example is a weapon, the included weapons that have a awesome critical hit ability, like just like, oh, plus six damage or does something really cool that uses blue dice. And while the blue dice don't have any critical hit symbols on them, and there's literally no way in the box to get those powers to ever go off. I'm like, this makes no sense. So we did some additional research and we learned that there are ammo cards and other cards in the expansions that can add other dice to these weapons, dice that have crit symbols on them. 
but you're not going to find them in this box. Now, in particular, I noted I played the Karja Warrior. One of their final level skills is a new Karja Spear that because of this is actually worse than the base weapon because it uses blue dice and you'll never get its crit to go off. Yeah, this was uh, this was shocking. The top level upgrade that was, as far as I'm concerned, broken mm-hmm. as it uh, as it required unknowingly a completely separate purchase to make and, and purchase as in financial purchase. Yes. To make what should be a character's top weapon worth owning at all ever. Yeah. And it's not the only one. There was other ones that came up in the merchant decks that I was like, why would you buy this? This doesn't work. And I almost wonder if they changed what were on the dice before the game was published. The the blue dice at one time had a critical hit symbol on it, and they removed it at some point to go, no, this is a damage only die. Anyway, I I can't tell you why, but this is a frustration um, with the game. If if you back the Kickstarter and went all in and got all the stuff, maybe you never even noticed. But what we're reviewing here is the retail copy that people can buy at their local game store or online. Now, another issue that came up when learning this game was the real rule book, which could use some work. Now, it's okay. It's written in a logical order to sit down on your couch and read through. But it's not great for teaching the game or referencing dream play. And the biggest issue, and it's one we talked about our what makes for a bad rule book uh, episode, is lots of little tiny rules that are scattered throughout the book in places you wouldn't think to look for them. An example would be status effects. Instead of just having a page that says status effects or a summary of status effects, instead you get to the hunter damage section and there's a whole section on what status effects do to hunters. Then later in the book, when you go into monster effects, you have a list of status effects and what happens to monsters. How are those not in one place? Like there should just be one section that tells you what status effects do to monsters or machines and to to the hunters. I just found that, and and these two sections aren't like it's on one page and you flip the page. It's like a totally different section of the rulebook, multiple pages apart. Now, while this made learning the game rough with our first couple of hunts, taking probably double the time they should have, once you do get everything down, the game had a pretty solid flow. With a group of experienced players, I think you really can get down to an hour and possibly less per encounter. I highly recommend when you're learning the game, have at least one person download the PDF version of the of the manual, throw it on a tablet or a laptop and use word searches. Yeah. This saves you a lot of page flipping. That is assuming you at least know the game terms well enough. Sometimes there, there were certain terms where I couldn't find them because I, I didn't remember off the top of my head what the game called that thing. Mm hmm. Overall, we found Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game, to be an excellent adaptation of the video game. I love the way it focuses on one part of the series and then makes that part shine. Through the exploration, encounter, and camping system, you really do get a feel of being on a hunt. And the character progression you make as the hunt goes on feels very rewarding. The problem with this, though, is that a full hunt is a long, epic event. Longer than most people are going to want to play through, especially in one night. I think if this had been a four, maybe five hour game from start to finish, I would have been more excited. And perhaps with experience, it might get down to that short a game. But getting that experience is a bit of a crawl. Now, groups also need to look at what type this game this is, what what category it falls into, I guess. It's, this is a thematic dice chucker with strong character optimization options. And before deciding if this game is for you or not, you need to realize this. You also have to be aware that this box is only a taste of what Steamforge has to offer for Horizon Zero Dawn. In this box, you're only getting one hunt and four characters, and there's a good chance you're going to end up wanting more. One other thing we didn't note, but that comes as part of being a semi-co-op, is a potential quarterback issue. It wasn't something we had a problem with, but... If you are discussing tactics, as with most games of that style, it can be an issue. Now, I will say it's alleviated a bit when you are playing competitively, because if someone else is telling you what to do, you need to take into effect they may be doing it for their own gain. And I did find for a semi-co-op, there was almost no quarterback when we were playing, except for just a couple things at the very end. We we're on the boss fight, and we were worried about winning. If anything, the, one of the biggest problems or times it comes up is the very start. So your first 
action of the game, yep. which can make that's true make or break something. <laughs> yeah, no, that is true. Now, for fans of Horizon Zero Dawn, you're going to want to check this game out somehow. If you're a fan of thematic games, if you like dungeon crawlers and dice heavy adventure games, you just go pick this up. It's a, it's a safe buy. Now, if you and your group generally prefer games with less randomness and more player control, I recommend finding a way to try before you buy. If you know nothing about Horizon Zero Dawn like me, there's still a lot to like in this game. I knew nothing about it or its setting and was easily able to jump in as the theme of a pack of hunters trying to take down a legendary beast is pretty universal. Now, if you're more into the Euro side of gaming and prefer games like Gloomhaven, say, over Descent, this is probably not the game for you. That said, my wife is the big Euro gamer in our group, and she ended up enjoying the game way more than expected. Though do note, she is a big fan of the video game series. For me, I personally can't wait until we've got another weekend and we can dedicate to trying out the Stormbird expansion and seeing just how much swapping up the hunt actually does change the game. Well, that's it for our review of Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game. Have thoughts on Horizon Zero Dawn, the original digital game, or this one? Why not join our Discord at discord.tabletopbellhop.com and start up a conversation. For a somewhat more detailed look at this board game version of Horizon Zero Dawn and lots of pictures from our gameplays, I do invite you to check out my written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode-ish. Of course, not SeanCon, because the big thing that happened last week was SeanCon, and we just did all kinds of talk about SeanCon. Like, uh, uh, I'd scroll back if you somehow missed that. <laughs> I'm not sure how you did. Um, so I did get in a bit of gaming when Sean wasn't around. So this was, this was a good week for games, actually, for me. So the big one uh, that we haven't talked about yet tonight was finally got to try My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game. Yes, that's the full name um, with four players. So first time playing with four. Um, also, the first time using the situation cards, which are like bad things that come up while you're playing that come up in the deck that they recommend not using for your first couple, couple of games. And I will say without them, the game was easy. We, we it never felt all that close to losing. Adding these in definitely made things more difficult. Um, I, I enjoyed having them there. The big thing they do, because Sean did play the first time we played this, is while they're up, you add an additional car, uh, cloud for every situation card that's up. Now, in this play, we wiped them out the turns they came up every time. But we basically wasted a turn to do that. Um, they cost like six to eight help to get rid of. And the neat part about those is here's where, remember when we were first playing, we were talking about being able to contribute on other players' turns, and I got a little confused on using the tokens. What it is is any player can contribute to get rid of situation cards. So that's where that got a little confused. So I dug that because it added more player interaction. It got the... Well, I don't have enough, but you can contribute your stuff to help me solve this situation. Yeah. Now, the situations, of course, were very My Little Pony. Like, we had a cloudy day. How horrible. Right? So it, that part was cute. Yeah, game knowing, felt better with four. Yeah. Knowing how the game plays makes it easier to play. Like, the, the game really needs that first learning game yeah. to, to understand it. Um, Eyesight, of course, makes this game even more important. Uh, <laughs> Good eyesight makes the game playable. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Yeah, overall, I, I liked it better with four. It played better. It felt like it was supposed to play with four. Um, game was longer, but it was kind of more engaging. Um, felt like we got a lot more done. And by, by a lot more done, I mean going to different parts of Ponyville and doing the actions on them to actually like cycle through the deck. We actually saw all but one location card in that game. Um, situation cards were a nice addition. Um, honestly, besides that, everything we shared said when we shared our first, uh, the first time we played it and second time is still the same. Uh, it's still not a kid's game. Uh, so not a kid's game. This is fairly complicated. Um, and well, the design choices, like, like the terrible graphic design choices, um, I will say it's getting better in a way because we're starting to get used to the cards. Especially those starter one movement cards. Everyone now knows those are movement cards. They're like, oh, the card without icons must be a move card. But unfortunately, those 
those the horseshoes on the locations yes are still horrible like yeah just they're, they're as still unreadable sure as can be yeah i i don't know you're like looking at six point font maybe by the time like it's it's tiny well it's a six um, point font wedged into a graphic that is now overlapping and wrapping into the text yeah, and it's it's rough oh. i i don't get it I'm i'm not sure how that one got through quality control now, I will say what has happened now that I played enough games is that you get used to what's on each one. So, like, you'll know every town card has three things. And the format's the same, and they're always in the same order. So the top is always spend generic resources for a sugar cube, whatever they happen to be. So basically, you're like, oh, is that books? Oh, is that speed? Oh, is that horseshoes? Uh, so that's not that bad. And then the second thing is always spend something to get something. So you're like, okay, what do I have to spend to get the books? Or what, 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 okay, I can toss my sugar cube to get what? And then the third one is the one that's almost impossible to read, which is spend six or eight help to get three cubes and get a discount based on something you have in your deck. So it's now changed to, it's not read me that card. It's the, okay, is that a six or an eight on that card? Or it's a, okay, so what does two books give you? versus read me the entire thing so it's it's gotten better but that's not excusing the game yeah no absolutely uh it again it's a really solid game i really like what they've done with the multiple uh component with the multiple things you need to track multiple resources and things to track uh but it is hurt by this this graphical design yeah, Deanna still hasn't even been able to play. Like, her, her eyes keep getting better, and she's like, nope, can't nope, play this game. She. Uh, nor should she until they are actually fully healed. I, I, and it, I don't know if they'll ever get there. Like, not that she won't heal, but, like, she had eyesight problems in the first place, and it may be an unplayable game to her. Yeah, mind, mind-bogglingly bad design choices. I'm sorry, Renegade, for an otherwise great game, you don't get a pass on the design yeah. here. Really confused. I, I also wonder if it like carries over to their other deck builders, which I haven't played. If this is just like their card design it choice. It wasn't something I noticed on G.I. Joe, but then I only played the digital version, so I don't know yeah. how that translated to the physical. All right, the other game I played was Siege of Valeria. This is the cooperative. No. No. Solo. Well, <laughs> technically, I guess it could be played. This is the solo version of a uh, Valeria game. It's part of the three small box games that were kickstarted recently that seem to be in stores now. Still don't see them on Amazon, but they seem to be sold out other places. So second time playing uh, much better this time. Um, I've read the cards. I know what to pay attention to. Definitely better than the learning game. Uh, they even managed to win, though barely. Um, two rounds to the end of the game, I realized I missed something about the game. And and that might have been another big part. Like, besides the fact that I didn't fully read what a siege machine was going to do and it took me out because I already had one flame. Like, more of I'm like, man, how am I going to win this? This seems impossible. What am I doing wrong? And I'm like, the, the big thing is, okay, so siege engines. The start of the round is roll all your dice. And then the siege engines attack if they're in range. Which means the only way to hit a siege engine is it got to go, right? So I'm like, what the heck's going on? How, how do I get past this? And then if the siege engines aren't in range, I can't attack them. So I'm like, I'm stuck attacking the Vanguard. But it just didn't click into me that when I attack the Vanguard, there's now less ranks to the siege engine. So I can now reach them. And then I'm like, oh, that's what I'm missing is I need to take out the guys at the front line to be able to get to the siege engines, which I totally missed. And if you do it properly, they don't get to attack because you defeat the guys before they get to go. So I'm like, wow, I totally missed that. And I got to say, that was the game changer I needed um, to be able to figure out what to do. And I, and I managed to take out, uh, it, was, it was four total siege engines in the last round. And it was at the point that the the monster deck that just keep coming out, if that ex you lose if the siege engines reach you, and you also lose if the monster deck runs out. And well, the monster deck was out. If I didn't win this round, the game was over and I managed to pull it off. So it sounds like that's a key tactic, but then it's also not supposed to be easy. I mean, it, it no. is a it is a cooperative game. These are never easy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I gotta say, overall, it, it's kind of a neat system. Um, it's all about rolling in like a big pile of dice. Like like Shadowrun players would be happy with this. You roll a bunch of d sixes, and then you puzzle out how to spend them. 
Um, the biggest thing, though, being that every monster you defeat becomes a card in your hand and every card modifies the dice. So it's really about optimization. It's about figuring out the best combo of cards. But it's not just you don't just look at the cards in your hand and the dice you rolled. You're looking at what you can kill because those become cards in your hands. So it's figuring out that perfect puzzle of if I use this card with this die means I can kill this guy, which puts the card in my hand, which I can then use to boost this die to kill this guy. And if this guy overkills, you kill the card ahead of it. And the one I kill ahead now moves this close enough to attack. Like that's kind of the, the brain space you're in. Now, I will say the early game is super punishing because, again, you can't attack Siege Engine until it's in range. But the turn it starts in range, the Siege Engine is going to go off and the Siege Engine attacks are nasty. It's like burn a red and blue die destroy your die destroy a character in a spot like it, they're they're nasty fair enough so no one ever said that being under siege would be fun just ask steven seagal now i also like the bit where you're probably gonna have to let some troops crash against your walls and end up damaging them because if you just focus on the vanguard which is that first row of enemies and they're the ones that are going to damage you if you leave them go you're not going to win if all you keep doing is just clearing the vanguard every round you're just not going to have enough damaging cards to take out those siege engines. Much like Castle Panic in that way, sometimes the walls need to do their job. Yeah, I will admit there's a bit of similarity between those two games. Though so far I've won this one, so I guess we're doing better. Now, I, I would say after two plays, I get it. Like it took a second play to really kind of get everything that was going on. I will say it's interesting, but I got to say, I'm sorry to say it, but I don't think this one's for me. Now, first off, I'm not a solo player. I am not that much of a solo player at all if i'm gonna play something solo i'm gonna go play a video game that's probably the big problem here this isn't my style of game i don't dig solo games but more than most games i kept thinking how i want this to be a video game i i want to just click on cards and and let it do the math and have it remember to make all the siege engines attack and remind me to draw an event card after because it's roll your dice have the siege engines go, then draw an event card, then spend your dice. And you roll those dice and you immediately start seeing the patterns and you want to jump to it. And they're like, oh yeah, siege engines. And then you start going like, oh crap, I didn't draw an encounter. I got to back that up, right? I want a computer to manage all that. Well, understandable. There's a, there's a number of games I've run into, and especially solo games, where you don't have the benefit of, of the other players helping manage the table. Mm -hmm. uh, I really tend to be much in the same idea, which in part explains why I still haven't set up my one deck galaxy yet. Doesn't that one play two, though? It's one or two. One or two. Okay. So at least there is a two player. This is solo only. And I can't really like except for shared hand and discussing it. I can't see a real way to play this multiplayer. Now, what I want to do with this one, um, obviously, I'm not ready for a full review yet. I've only played it twice. I'd like to get some more plays in there. But I want you and Deanna to try it before we do up a formal review. And then I'll crack open the campaign expansion, because as you pointed out when we talked about it after my first play, many people online have said that's needed to make the game. Maybe that'll win me over. But what I don't want is I don't want it to influence my review of the base game, because it's very likely if it does improve it that much that I'm going to see the original game in more rosy glasses. And I don't want to do that. So I want to put that aside, but I want to get you and Deanna to at least play it. Maybe get one of the kids to try to try it again myself. But I will say... It, I'm not into solo games. This is not a game that's meant for me, so I understand it, but it, it definitely is not winning me over so far. Like it, it, it was neat, but I don't need to do it again. Fair enough. Well, that's it for what we've been playing. Now let's have a look at what we have coming up next. All right, so the main thing I want to do before next week is get in more plays of Disney Sorcerer's Arena with the three expansions, and I want to try My Little Pony both at one and two players. I've now played it at three and four. Four was better. See how it plays with two and check out the solo experience, though. As I just said, I'm not necessarily the best person, but heck, if it wins me over all the power to it, then hopefully we'll be ready to review all of them, uh, which we may do next week. Although we did talk about not wanting to do three reviews, doing four might be a bit much, but I will say the Disney one should be short and sweet, right? Like I, you buy it. We've already described Disney Source Arena. Go check our review. Here's what we thought of these three characters. Like, that's pretty much it. So we might be able to hammer through those. I'm more worried about doing the written review up after the fact, <laughs> where I tend to be a little more verbose. I need to uh, sort through my DC content, because with Sean Con happening, I didn't get to go through it. 
and start reboxing. But uh, I'm actually not home this weekend either. So <laughs> maybe two weekends before that happens. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping this weekend we can get in some Disney with the kids. I'm, I'd like, I'd, I also we should try it for players, too, because we haven't done that yet. Maybe my youngest daughter would enjoy the game more only having to control two characters instead of three. Now, besides that, we do have some new stuff that should be showing up, but I'll save those to talk about once I actually have the boxes in hand. This show wouldn't be possible without our Patreon patrons, our VIP guests. So here's a quick shout out to five of them. Uh, first off, I want to send out a huge, big congratulations to our friends and patrons, Kat and Tori, and the latest member of the Dome family, Clark, who's now home with mom and both are doing great. Brian Van Beek. Thank you, Brian. Diane Thuzano. Thanks, mom. The Misdirected Mark podcast. Thank you, friends from Buffalo that we hope to see at Origins. It has been far too long. It has. I don't even know if I remember what all those people look like. Dukas, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at TabletopBellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Keep the conversation going long after this episode airs by joining us on the Tabletop Bellhop Discord at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. Please consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. That's all for us tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us live, and be sure to stick around for the Penthouse Suite After Show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.